We've said it before on our show, and we'll say it again. We don't usually like to talk about the killer in cases more than the victims. We're here to share the victim story that deserves to be told. And we like to be advocates for families and a platform for those who need it. That being said, sometimes there is a case that we feel compelled to talk about where there just isn't much information about the victims. We never mean any disrespect when we talk about these cases, and we just want the information out there for educational purposes. We are weird true crime, after all, and we can't help but share those stories that really make you say, what the f Today's story is exactly one of those stories. Over the past year of us presenting these cases to you, we've talked about kids who have killed their family members, an evil stepmother who murdered her stepson in one of the most heinous ways, as well as evil deeds carried out by complete strangers on complete strangers. Today's case falls into the latter category, but done by a couple of people you'd probably least expect. Join us today as we talk about Faye and Ray Copeland and their reign of terror during the late 1980s. Let's go back to the very beginning by talking about Ray Copeland. Raymond Ray Copeland was born on December 30th of 1914 in Salisaw, Oklahoma to parents Jess and Lainey Copeland. Throughout his childhood, his family moved around a lot searching for work wherever they could. The start of the Great Depression also meant that schools had less money, which meant fewer teachers, and the teachers that were working were paid less. Many of the schools closed because they just didn't have enough money to stay open, and the schools that did stay open were overcrowded. Because of this, many students quit school to work in factories, shine shoes, or sell newspapers, including Ray. Unfortunately, this meant that he was going to be functionally illiterate for the rest of his life, having dropped out of school at an early age. It's said that his friends and family described him as spoiled and demanding, that even though the family was struggling to make ends meet, if there was something that he wanted, he figured out any way to make it happen and get what he wanted. That's a nice trait. Isn't it, though? No. Ray's first known crime happened at the age of 20 when he stole two hogs from his own father and sold them in another town. Lucky for him, his father covered for him and no charges were pressed. That was just the beginning for Ray. In 1936, he was caught forging government checks in Harrison, Arkansas and sentenced to a year in county jail. I'm not sure if kids these days even know what a check is anymore, but back then, it wasn't a new concept. The United States began using checks in 1784 at the Bank of New York. As time went on, banks created new ways to help prevent forgeries by printing and binding checkbooks for their customers and including more information on the checks, like the customer's name. Still, things weren't as instantaneous as they are these days. When somebody deposited or cashed a check, it took a while and often left a lot of room for forgeries and fraud. Banks could only cash checks by sending porters to the other bank from where the funds had been drawn. Eventually, this process became too time-consuming and inefficient, and bankers developed clearing houses so they could cash their checks in a central location. The clearing process took so long that it increased the risk of checks not being paid which Ray took full advantage of. A little history Shh. lesson for you there. That's interesting. I had no idea. I bet a lot of people took advantage of that situation, unfortunately. Shortly after Ray got out of jail for the check forgery, he met his future wife, Faye Della Wilson. She was born August 4th, 1921 in Harrison, Arkansas to parents Rufus and Gladys Wilson, who were very hardworking despite having little money and managed to raise seven children in a dirt floor cabin. Wow. At the time Faye met Ray, she was only 19 years old. 
at the time in 1940, the average age for women to get married was around 21 years old. So she was a little young, but that didn't stop them from getting married only six months after they met. In 1941, they had their first child, a son named Everett. Two years later, they had another son named Billy Ray. Before the birth of their third child, their first and only daughter, Betty Lou, the couple moved to Fresno, California, where they ended up having two more children, Alvia in 1947 and William Wayne in 1949. Unfortunately, Ray was violent and abusive to all of them, beating them with anything that he could lay his hands on, including cast iron skillets. Since Faye was raised a Christian fundamentalist, she was raised to believe that the husband was the head of the household and the divorce was a sin, so she would not leave him. Later on in her life, in an interview, she said she bowed her head and took it. The year that their youngest child was born, a nearby farmer accused Ray of stealing horses from them. No charges were filed, but Ray decided to move his family back to Arkansas. Less than a month after the family returned to Arkansas, he was arrested for stealing cattle and served a year in the state penitentiary. At least Faye and their children got a little bit of a break from his abuse. When Ray was released from prison in 1950, he moved to Rocky Comfort, Missouri, where he was arrested yet again. For what? You guessed it, stealing cattle. This time, he was sentenced to manual labor on the judge's farm. In 1953, they moved to Illinois, but then he kept moving the family around for the following eight years, all the while getting arrested for writing forged checks pretty regularly. Eventually, they bought a 40-acre farm in Mooresville, Missouri in 1967. Faye joined the workforce to help support the farm working in a factory, and then later on being a motel maid. Ray had developed a habit of buying and selling livestock, but was eventually banned because of scamming. So in the 1970s, he hatched a new way to continue doing what he was doing without being directly involved. His scam would involve drifters to pass forged checks at cattle auctions, so by the time the checks would bounce, Ray would have already sold the livestock and the drifter would be long gone. This method worked for a little while until finally one of the drifters was caught and confessed to the police. Ray was yet again arrested and sentenced to jail for forgery. When Ray got out of jail this time, he knew that he couldn't continue using the same plan as before. Things were going to have to change. By the 1980s, Ray was in his late 60s, early 70s, and his children were grown and had left the farm. He was also hard of hearing and, as we mentioned earlier, illiterate from his lack of education, so he needed help on the farm. He decided he would then recruit homeless men from missions and shelters in nearby towns, offering them $50 a week plus room and board to help, which seemed absolutely too good to be true. And boy, was it. Ray would have the men open a checking account in their own name. With $200, Ray would front them and use a P.O. box as an address. Since Ray was banned, he couldn't purchase livestock directly, so he would bring the men to various cattle auctions and signal them to which cattle to buy and for how much. During their first round, the check would clear, so they would sell the cattle and then go back and do it again. The second time around, however, the check wouldn't clear. Ray would have already sold the cattle and the homeless man would be gone. In 1986, a man by the name of Dennis Murphy was wanted for writing bad checks at cattle auctions. During their investigation, the police discovered that the cattle had been taken away in a trailer belonging to Ray Copeland, so they went to talk to the elderly man and his wife. Ray and Faye told the police that Murphy had also written them bad checks and he just decided to leave one day without any warning. Since Murphy was a known drifter, the police let it go and didn't look further into it. 
a deputy from another county came looking for a man named Wayne Warner later on. The Copelands gave him the same story about Warner writing them bad checks and then just disappearing. In total, seven men were wanted for these forged checks written at cattle auctions throughout central Missouri. All of them were missing, and all of them were in some way related to Ray Copeland. In August of 1989, the Missouri police received a phone call from a man named Jack McCormick in Nebraska. He told them he thought he had seen a human skull and bones on the Copeland's farm. In early October 1989, the sheriff and 40 police officers raided the Copeland farm with a search warrant, even using cadaver dogs. They unfortunately found nothing during this search. They took McCormick into custody, where he recanted his statement about finding the bones and instead revealed to them all about Ray's check-cashing scam that he had been conned into. Jack was terrified of Ray and told the police exactly why. He said that one night Ray asked him to go out to a neighbor's barn to assist him in taking care of a raccoon that had gotten in there. Ray grabbed his 22 bolt bolt-action Marlin rifle, and the two set off to the neighbor's barn. When Jack went to poke a stick to get the raccoon out, he turned and found Ray had the 22 pointed right at his head. Somehow, he managed to talk Ray out of shooting him with the promise that he would leave town and never return. Before he left, he asked Ray to take him to the bank so he could deposit his earnings to cover the hot checks he had written. Ray agreed, but McCormick slipped out the back of the bank over to a used car lot where he convinced the salesman to let him take one of the cars on a test drive, thus securing his getaway car. He waited until he was out of Missouri and into Nebraska before he called in the tip. Even though no remains had been located on the Copeland's property, the police were finally piecing together that there were seven missing men, all wanted for writing bad checks at cattle auctions, and, as we said, all of them connected to Ray and Faye Copeland. Not, not looking good, Ray and Faye. Not looking good. A local tipped off to the authorities that Ray often worked on a neighboring farm and that one of the barns on the property smelled like a dead animal. When the police searched the property and that barn, they discovered a shallow grave containing the skeletal remains of three men, all of which were killed by a 22 bullet to the back of the head at close range. They continued to search the property, and in another barn, they found another body, and after more searching, found one last body in a well. The last man they found had been wearing a belt with the name Dennis on it. The police searched the Copeland's home and found many of the missing men's clothing and, hidden in a camera case, a list of men's names. Some of the names had X's next to them, and nearly all of them had been wanted in connection with the hot check scam. All of the bodies were badly decomposed, and it had been difficult to identify them. Since they were transients, any medical or dental records they could obtain were very old or just didn't exist, and many had gone decades without dental care. The families of the men likely didn't even realize they were missing, much less no longer living. Dennis Murphy was identified by the odd shape of his mandibular condyle, which is the joint of the jawbone, and forensic scientists were able to identify the other bodies as those belonging to Paul Cowart, James Harvey, John Freeman, and Wayne Warner. Each one of these men was on the list the police found and had X's next to their names. Ray and Faye Copeland were charged with the murder of the five men and tried separately with Faye going first on November 1st, 1990, at the age of 69. Faye's son and court-appointed psychologist were not convinced she was guilty. This was largely due to the fact that, technically, the only evidence that tied Faye to the crimes was the list that was found hidden in the camera bag in her handwriting, 
and a quilt she had made using the clothing of the dead men. The psychologist, Dr. Marilyn Hutchinson, also stated that Faye suffered from textbook battered woman syndrome. Faye said time and time again that whatever Ray said or did, she did not ask questions for fear of being beaten, and that Ray had carried out the killings without her knowledge. Dr. Hutchinson also testified that Faye was able to discern right from wrong. This suggested that Faye was coerced into being part of her husband's nefarious activities. The prosecution had even offered her a plea deal, but she didn't take it because she swore she had no information to give. She didn't know where any of the bodies were because she didn't know about the murders. Sources indicated that due to a technicality, the defense was unable to use the psychologist's statement that she suffered from battered woman syndrome in the trial. The jury was never able to hear any testimony or see any evidence about the abuse she suffered from Ray or how he had controlled her. She was convicted of the murder solely due to the handwritten list and the quilt she had made. The jury took less than three hours to return a guilty verdict, and the prosecutor told her, quote, I'm sorry, Mrs. Copeland. We have exposed you and your husband in your vile little game, end quote. On April 27, 1991, she was sentenced to death and became the oldest woman on death row. So often when we hear of a woman who has been repeatedly abused or beaten by her partner, we hear someone ask, why does she stay with them? The answer is extremely complicated and may only make sense to someone who has experienced the same thing. According to psychologist Lenore Walker, battered woman syndrome is considered a type of post-traumatic stress disorder and is defined as the psychological effects of living with intimate partner violence. She explains that it is not a mental illness, but the result of what happens when you live day in and day out with trauma. The partner of a woman with BWS needs to know where she is at all times, cuts her off from her friends and family, and retains financial control so she doesn't have the money to leave. They're known to threaten to kill the woman and anyone she loves, including her family, children, and pets, and they could even threaten to kill themselves. All of these factors make it seem near impossible for her to leave safely, so they end up staying and enduring the abuse. It is now more commonly referred to as intimate partner violence, and there is a whole lot more that could be said, but we'll leave this particular topic with the number to the National Domestic Violence Hotline at 1-800-799-7233 or text START to 88788. And that is so true and it needs to be talked about more and people need to be more understanding of what it is because even as a as a woman who's never been in that situation it's really easy to just look at somebody and go just get out like why are you still there or putting up with this and it's so much deeper than that and not at all a simple situation so you you can't help but feel bad for Faye a little bit here just a little bit yeah when Faye was sentenced, she sobbed uncontrollably. The morning after her conviction, a sheriff was transporting Ray to a Kansas City hospital for a mental examination, and during the trip, he brought up Faye's trial, asking if he had heard about the verdict. Ray said no and asked what happened. The sheriff told him that they found her guilty and recommended execution for her. Ray's response was, quote, well, those things happen to some, you know, end quote. And he never asked about her again. Wow. Ray's trial began the following year on March 7th. At first, Ray pleaded insanity, but quickly dropped that idea. He then attempted to make a plea deal with prosecutors, but they were not willing to negotiate with him. With weeks of testimony and the results of the prosecution's ballistic test, 
a jury found Ray Copeland guilty on all five counts of first-degree murder. He was then sentenced to death by lethal injection. And his only response to the news was mumbling, quote, I'm okay, end quote. Ray and Faye Copeland became the oldest couple in American history ever sentenced to death at the ages of 76 and 69. On October 19, 1993, just two years after his trial, Ray passed away at the Potosi Correctional Center while awaiting execution from natural causes. Due primarily to their lifestyles, there was very little information available about the proven victims of Ray and Faye Copeland. Their first victim, Dennis Murphy, was born in 1962 in Normal, Illinois. He was killed on October 17th of 1986. Wayne Warner, the second victim, was from Bloomington, Illinois, and was killed on November 19th, 1986. So just a month after Dennis. Wow. Jimmy Dale Harvey, the third victim, was born in 1961 and was from Springfield or Ludlow, Missouri, and was 27 years old when he died on October 25th of 1988. John Wayne Freeman, their fourth victim, was born on January 6th of 1962 in Boonville, Indiana, he was murdered on December 8th of 1988 at the age of 25. The fifth victim, Paul Jason Cowart, was born on September 30th of 1968 in Danville, Arkansas, to parents Richard and Edith. He was only 21 years old when he was murdered on May 3rd of 1989. Besides these five known men, the Copelands were also suspected in the deaths of seven other men, and possibly even more. But none have been discovered. Mm. Faye continued to maintain her innocence years after her husband passed away. In 1995, a petition demanding her release from prison circulated and gathered over 3,000 signatures. The petition claimed that Faye was not a threat to society due to her age. On August 6, 1999, Faye's death sentence was overturned, but not her murder convictions, and her sentence was commuted to five consecutive life terms with no possibility of parole. In that same year, another petition gathered even more signatures and claimed that her age, as well as her perfect record as an inmate, warranted her release. Faye's attorney was quoted saying, The evidence of Faye's guilt was pretty thin. Faye just happened to be there. She works in the greenhouse at the prison every day. She wouldn't hurt a fly. I think you can ask the warden and he would say he could open the door and there wouldn't be a danger to anybody, end quote. On the other hand, according to a court document regarding her appeal of her conviction, Faye often conversed with the farmhands, handled bank transactions, and later told banks she didn't know who the men were when the checks would bounce. People believed there was sufficient evidence that Faye was aware of Ray's scheming and also most likely aware of the murders. Faye suffered from a stroke in 2002 that left her partially paralyzed and unable to speak. Weeks later, she was sent to a nursing home and she died a year later on December 23rd, 2003, at the age of 82. This is hard. Obviously, Ray is a giant piece of narcissistic shit and has a lifetime history of, you know, selfish deeds. Um, he's obviously only out to help himself here. And I think he saw in Faye a person who could help him do the things that he couldn't do, like write the checks and deal with some of the other things that he may not have been educationally, you know, able, able to handle. Um, but I, I do understand why Faye got convicted. She was still there. She still 
probably did play a part in it and knew more than she said she did. I don't think she had a choice. Uh, I think she did it for her own safety and the safety of her children, but she was still involved. And I do think the sentence was needed, maybe not necessarily being sentenced to death, but (sighs) see, I keep going back and forth on whether or not I believe Faye had knowledge of the murders that Ray had committed or not. Like, you know, he was illiterate. He could have just been telling her what to write down for him. And maybe he told her to put the X's next to the names of the men who were no longer willing to participate in the cattle scam, which could be that I'm pretty convinced she at least knew about, mm-hmm, the scam. Uh, you know, as far as the quilt, uh, she, she was a thrifty woman and Considering the lifestyles of the men, they weren't going to be coming back for the clothes. So Mm -hmm. she just recycled them in a beneficial way. I don't know. She had been raised in an era where you really did just keep your head down and, for Mm -hmm. lack of a better term, obey your husband no matter what. Yeah. I did read in an interview Faye had done with Lee Cavanaugh of the Kansas City Star after her sentencing She had told him that she wasn't even allowed to have flowers at home. Ray didn't like her paying attention to anything other than him. It was fine if she was with him or working the cattle or the tractor, but flowers weren't allowed. She also said, quote, maybe we'd have gotten along better if I had knocked the shit out of him a few times. I've often thought since maybe this was for the best, Where did I go wrong, if I went wrong? I know one place was getting married at all. But he was my life for many, many years. I didn't know nothing else. Will I get out? I may go out feet first, but I'll get out of here. Someday. End quote. Mm, Man. So, I, I, I don't... I don't, I, I, yeah, I just, I go back and forth on whether or not she had knowledge of the murders. But, yeah, she definitely, with the check cashing scam Mm -hmm. i don't know that she necessarily should have gotten the the death penalty no for that i don't think she should have i don't think she should have been sentenced to death i think she was obviously part of something illegal and needed to be sentenced for something but uh it's hard to say i guess we'll never know let us know listener what you think about this case Do you believe Faye was the victim of her husband's heinous behavior, or do you think she was his willing accomplice? You can find us on all the socials, and we'll have our links in the show notes. Be sure to join us next week for an all-new What the Fuck Wednesday, where we explore the lighter and sometimes educational side of true crime. Until next time, stay safe. And make good choices. Bye. 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 Bye.